So welcome all. Thank you for coming to our little talk today about reconfigurable computing for Linux. Uh, my name is Vince Bridgers, and this is Eve van der Vene. Hello. Uh, I work in the OpenCL HLS development team at, at Altera, now Intel PSG. And Eve works in the Linux development group, running the Linux development team. So I'll start, and I'll present a few slides, and then I'll turn it over to Eve, and then I'll continue. So today we're going to give a brief introduction to heterogeneous computing. Uh, we'll cover a range of system structures that we think need to be supported, some interesting use cases, and then we'll present what we consider to be you know, a proposal at this point in time for heterogeneous computing architecture for Linux. Uh, this is not anywhere final, it's just something that we're thinking through, um, and we'd like to get your feedback if we could at some point. So uh, how many people have tried to program an FPGA and use it in an embedded system? Was it easy? Nah. I guess it depends on the problem you're trying to solve, wasn't it? Did you write HDL or did you use some of the higher level languages or? Different things. Well, so this can be quite difficult, uh, depending on the problem. Um, Intel ISG has OpenCL tools that help with the data parallel tasks, but uh, we, we hear from customers that these are not easy to use. So this architecture tries to address this problem, and there's a really nice quote from Steve Jobs. I'll not read it to you, but uh, you as programmers know that uh, parallel programming can be quite difficult, depending on the kinds of problems you're trying to solve. So with this, I'll turn it over to Eve, and you shall continue. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, we have a few objectives with this architecture proposal. The first one is, of course, to use open source software. Um, and I have a reference implementation as a starting point for developers. Um, as far as FPGAs are concerned, uh, there's already some infrastructure in the Linux kernel for that, so we, we want to leverage it. Um, we want to accelerate the adoption of acceleration technologies uh, across the market segment, from embedded to larger systems like data centers. Um, we also would like to make the interfaces open, that's clear, but also have possibly vendor-specific plugins for innovations and differentiation as everybody need them. So if we look at uh, a heat introduced system, we have different components. Uh, we have the CPUs, obviously, which can be in a SMP configuration. Uh, we can also have GPUs and DSPs that everybody knows, but we can also have these days FPGAs. Um, all these components can be connected over AXI, PCIe, you name it. And the reconfigurable part comes from the fact that some of these components can be reprovisioned with different features. And today's focus will be on FPGAs. So since there was just a few hands up, for FPGAs, I'm going to quickly remind everybody what it is. So it's a field programmable gate array. That means it's an array of programmable logic blocks. Some are generic. They provide features such as gates and flip-flops. And others are specific, like multipliers and transceivers. The FPGA is designed to be configured after manufacturing. Uh, the user design is written either in a hardware description language or also in C these days, where you can take your C code and translate it directly to gate. And this lovely design is then compiled into a bitstream. A bitstream is used to program the FPGA itself. In embedded devices, usually it's at boot time. The FPGA will program it itself from a non-volatile uh, storage, but we can also configure it at runtime with the OS. There are two types of configuration, either the full configuration that most people probably 
aware of where you configure the functions and the I.O. at the same time. You can also do partial reconfiguration where you target some section of the FPGA to change a function, for example. So the typical workflow, you start with your FPGA design, you turn that into a bit stream, and then you load it into the FPGA. Um, there are some use cases that I wanted to list here. Uh, in the industrial market, a lot of people do model control with uh, FPGAs. In the multimedia world, they do video and image processing. Telecommunication could be packet of loading. Um, and then in high performance computing, it could be search engine acceleration. So these are two typical systems that we need to take into account. On the left hand side you have the, I guess a picture of what could be a typical embedded system uh, with the CPUs, the FPGA, possibly a cache currency unit, and then your interconnect. On the left hand side you have more a server type of system with CPUs in their sockets connected to one another like Intel does over UPI and then each has its PCIe root port and connects to the I.O. that way. So these are different interconnects that the architecture is going to have to support. When it comes to use cases, uh, there are ranges of use cases that have different demands on performance. And if we go to the far right, we have the high performance computing for, for example, the climate modeling. These are going to need a lot of CPUs or a lot of offloading um, to have acceptable runtimes. Another aspect of FPGAs is that there are many studies that show that FPGAs tend to consume less power than GPUs. So for people in data centers, that's critical because a lot of the of the bill goes into uh, air conditioning. Wrong direction. So there are a few existing technologies that support reconfigurable computing. Um, these are, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, the first one is a Linux kernel FPGA manager. Uh, this is currently upstreamed and is being actively developed. Uh, there's OpenCL. Uh, OpenCL is a tool to develop, a, you know, complete software applications. It's a very, very, it was intended to be a very, very low-level development tool, uh, but it's being used to solve problems. So I think one of the things that we'd like to do with this reconfigurable computing architecture is, is bring that up to a little bit higher level to not only support OpenCL, but other ways to solve these types of problems. And then there's high-level synthesis, which is, High-level synthesis is an important component of reconfigurable computing, but it's not really the focus of our talk today. Um, I wanted to include it to, to be a little bit inclusive because it is part of our OpenCL product offering that we have at, at Intel PSG. This is our current Linux kernel FPGA manager framework. Uh, we support a higher level interface uh, to different APIs to control the FPGA. And these are basically for just programming the FPGA, reconfiguring the FPGA, uh, enumerating the types of FPGAs that are available. And this is, this is still currently under development. And then there's low-level FPGA device driver interfaces to interface directly to different FPGAs. This did not come out well. Hidden animation. So this is uh, today, this is our OpenCL programming, de programming development flow, and this is, you'll see this across different vendors that offer OpenCL. On the left-hand side is the host application. Uh, this, this program is typically, is, can be written in C or C++, and these contain the low-level APIs that will uh, download and run your kernel. This is uh, typically on Linux, you, you compile this using GCC, and you use a vendor runtime libraries uh, to, to get the support necessary to download and use your kernel. On the right-hand side is your typical kernel. This is written in C99 today. Um, and this is where your work is being done to offload certain types of tasks. And this is, in, in the FPGA case, um, this is compiled 
and synthesized and, and, and programmed directly into the FPGA. We also support uh, x86 and ARM today. So we'll go through some definitions as we work through the slide deck, uh, talk about the definitions first. Um, so we have CPUs, there's a CPU cores cluster. There can be any number of CPUs in your system. There's shared memory that is used by the CPUs and your offload components. And the interconnect can be anything, as Eve mentioned. It can be PCI Express, AXI. Um, it, it can also be other technologies that are being developed and will come out sometime in the near future. So this is another reason why it's important to talk about what sort of reconfigurable computing architecture we'd like to support now so that we can support these different interconnects. There's a layer that provides bus management for offloading the components, a device manager layer that allows you to enumerate the different FPGAs in the system and your different accelerator functions that you could program to your FPGA or your offload elements. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll refer to these functions as accelerator functions, AFs. These AFs can be dynamically inserted and removed. And one of the problems you encounter when you start dynamically inserting and removing is resource management. So in one case, you may want to insert a device. If, and if in the event that you don't have enough resource to insert that device, you may want to evict, evict a, a device. So this is one of the jobs that the, the reconfigurable compute architecture would provide. So what are some of the management actions that would be supported by this framework? One of the things I mentioned was insert an AF, and you would get some sort of success or fail. Another is to remove an AF, you would get a success or fail. You'd want to somehow query the capabilities of your underlying offload components. And you might want to initiate an evict action as well. This is not intended to be inclusive, but just a few examples of some of the things that, we, that you could do. So one of the issues you run into when you consider PCI Express and AXI are you know, PCIe supports the, the notion of being able to discover devices on the bus. AXI does not. So the, the reconfigurable computing architecture needs to be able to support both of these. And not only that, but if you look at the other interconnects that, are, that will be coming along in the near future, they may or may not be supporting these types of discovery features either. So there needs to be a way to support this. We refer to these two different types of interconnects as discoverable and non-discoverable for the purposes of discussing this architecture. So here is one example with PCI Express and AXI. We're proposing the use of device tree overlays. So you can have an, two different types of applications in this, in this example. And the applications are described using an AF descriptor. The AF descriptor contains information about if the AF needs to be a partial or a complete configuration, the I.O. resources and the interrupts required, if any, the class of device, the transceivers, I.O. pins required, and policies for configuration. So an example of a policy would be, uh, do, do I want to allow the, the framework to evict my, evict my AF or not? Another one would be, maybe I want to assign an affinity of an AF to a particular socket in a system so that I have proximity to a particular core for latency, latency optimization purposes. So these AF descriptors are compiled to device tree overlays. This step is done by the vendor libraries. The vendor libraries can be partially open source and can include vendor specific plugins. The device tree overlays may be used for discoverable and non-discoverable interconnects as, as was mentioned in the previous slide. The idea is that the device resource manager finds the matching FPGA with the required attributes and assigns that AF to the, to the resources that can host that particular AF. 
Yes. For compiling the AF, the, sorry, the AF descriptors. Yet there, well, I would refer to the device tree overlays at this point. Yes. Yeah, th those are two very good questions. So uh, for the first question, that was a really nice segue into the next slide. So we view OpenCL as an embedded, as embedded within this particular framework. So um, OpenCL would be described as a package that would be described by the AF descriptor. So I mean, one thing we didn't mention is CUDA. CUDA could be treated the same way. Um, but again, as I mentioned early in the presentation, many of these things are concepts at this point in time. So the details have not been quite worked out. Um, I just want to know about this framework. So whether this will just be, because we have, for instance, we are using FPGAs, but the, the, and also this FPGA and uh, OpenCL approach we are already implementing. And uh, the question is, because we are actually implementing and inventing our own framework. So if there comes something from Intel, and we are actually incorporating this into the Terra, so it's completely nonsense, the same work again. And we, for instance, are facing like, uh, if you do a suspend resume, and you want to unload the FPGA to save like 20 watts, and then it should automatically, after, after resume, it should be reloaded with the latest firmware, because we have different firmware, different modding. So whether this framework can be used for not only this OPCL approach, but all of the generic spend with you managing your FPGAs in a generic way, not related only to OPCL. Yeah, so those are good points. Uh, we will take those in consideration. Um, the idea is that we will consider these things and they will be part of the framework. So uh, that's, I, did that address your question? Yeah. Yeah. Look. Yes. And, yes. Uh, so, uh, yes. Yes. Let's do that. So this particular slide is very similar to the previous slide. The difference is um, it 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 uses OpenCL as an embedded, basically as an embedded AF within the AF descriptor. The AF descriptor describes an OpenCL kernel and an OpenCL host application. This could be a single uh, st a single stage offload or a multi-stage offload to the offload devices. And to answer your second question about PCI Express, um, so the, the idea is that the differences between AXI and PCI Express would be abstracted in the device resource manager layer. Yeah, yes, yes. That's right. So you wouldn't need a device tree overlay portion for a device that was attached through PCI Express. Also for x86, so everything works with yes. device tree. Yes. But so one of the benefits you get of using device tree overlays for an FPGA that's attached through PCI Express or AXI is you get to describe resources such as IO pins that may be on a particular fixed portion of a board. So that could be one thing that could be done. So here we talk about AF descriptors just a little bit. Uh, AF descriptors contain information about the AF required for the framework to instance the device. 
For each offload device needed, it contains a reference to the FPGA bitstream, expresses constraints such as the FPGA family, special resources pins, any sorts of policies such as priority request, affinity, proximity to a, a socket or a CPU, and a list of the devices. Um, and this could contain nested blocks of descriptors. So at the resource management framework layer, this would be a, vin a vendor agnostic API because the idea is we'd want to support a broad range of applications from a, a broad range of users. Uh, if you look at the different OpenCL offerings today, they're very vertically, uh, very vertically integrated. So you have your offering from Altera, for example, and it may not necessarily be compatible with other vendor offerings. So this is very limiting for people that want to develop OpenCL applications that work across a broad range of devices. So th this is one of the things we'd like to address with this framework. And uh, last slide, pretty much, um, we'd like to support this, this notion of exposing an AF to a virtual machine, and that would be done through VFIO. Uh, that's the way that we see this should be done. And... Uh, when we go, how, how far is this from reality? <laughs> <laughs> so some of the earlier pieces are done. You know, as, as you get to later in, you know, in this slide deck, uh, it's, it's a little bit far from reality at this point. Yes, yeah, so as I said earlier, this is meant to be more of a proposal to gather feedback. So, yes? All this, will this become all source? That's the idea, yes. So everyone can, so if I do work, I can contribute to that project? Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, there's a reconfigurable computing group that's being hosted and run by John Masters. Um, they met earlier this year and they'll be meeting later on this year again. So in summary, uh, we'd like to support as many embedded systems as well as client server systems as possible. We'd like to support as many different types of interconnects as possible support as many different offload elements as possible, um, and support exposure to AFs through a hypervisor and virtual machines. So with that, that is our presentation. I thank you for your patience and attention. If we have any questions, we'll, we'll try to answer them. Yes. Okay, I have um, one comment to make, and I think one thing which is pretty obvious if you look at the at CPU, you have the whole instruction set defined, and you know at a very low level how the hardware is working. And if you look at the FPGAs, it's kind of opaque. You just have the tools, you don't have a pretty low level access, and um, makes it kind of unattractive developing for FPGAs in an open source kind of way. And I would really like to see um, if the industry would be going back to a more open approach like Silence has been doing it 20 years ago with the C for problem we have the complete bit stream. Um, that, that, that's a very sensitive topic. We should take that <laughs> offline. <laughs> um, Sharon. Do you have any comments on that one? No, I, I, we, we hear you. We would like that too, but it's a little bit beyond the scope of this discussion, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's way above our pay grade. <laughs>
configure all um, FPGA um, registers with transactions and, and EMA and everything. So I really would love to, to get this to the community. So it, it, so it describes all the, the features and links how the, the, the FPGA can be linked with SPI or PCI Express and everything. There is every capabilities and all the, all the stuff is actually described uh, um, in an XML. And for for every we, we um, camera manufacturers and very capability of the FPGA, you have, you have like so-called device drivers, and you can just implement them, and then you have the backbone, and that all is ready to use. And I really would love to see it open source. So if there is by any chance, which is actually like it goes for introspection so actually our plan is to like have the the bitstream and then also the, the xml accordingly but we are now when we append this xml describing the fpga capabilities to the bitstream or we um, find in the power archive or whatever that's that's whole question of the mean the details but it's it's about we have something great to do it's like three three men here now by now and the system is working, we have proof of concept, so, so it, it really does what it should. And, okay. and it's also like continuous integration testing. We also have that in mind. We have complete continuous integration workflow. We change it, we compile the source code, we synthesis the FPGA, and then <coughs> we, we test again. We have test cases and everything. So if there is a platform to contribute, I would love to. Okay, I'd like to get your contact information. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, the, that is intended to be supported by this framework, yes. So you can so specify the formats and how to, which kind of data X-ray would accept and how to uh, send? Yes, yeah, so if you think about the OpenCL use case, that, that is a requirement. So yes, that, that will be supported. Any other questions? Uh, we have a booth. We have a booth. Well, we don't have a showcase of this. Uh, but there's no special showcase or no, no, no. So, have you been by our booth? Have you been by our booth? Yeah. I have been. Okay. Okay. We'll be back again. Yeah. More questions for. Okay. Great. We'll be there. Yes. The, the only showcase yes. would be ideas in our brains. You know. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So if you wanted to write your exploration in another agent of not OpenCL, is there any current industry collaboration effort going on to make sure you your sort of external interface to your acceleration function be similar for everyone? We've not started that yet, but that is something we intend to start, yes. But the, the OpenCL standard was uh, modified or influenced by Altera to add support for FPGA, so we hope that everybody uses it. At, at the OpenCL level? Yeah, at the yeah. OpenCL level, yeah. the standard, yeah. the, the group. Okay, with that, unless there's any other questions, uh, thank you for coming and your attention. And uh, you can come by the booth and and ask us all the questions you want. And uh, I'd definitely like to get your contact information. It's fine. Sure, I would love to mark that as hours. OK. We have 18 technical awards. It's a company is worldwide. We have invented the best motion picture cameras in the world. That's awesome. <laughs> OK. Thank you.